as we have learned about light in details where we found that light which was considered as a wave can also behave as a particle. So if we think in a reverse manner where light which was considered as a wave can behave like a particle. So can a particle behave like waves? So can particles also exhibit properties which are exhibited by waves? So a French scientist named De Bruyne said that a particle can also behave like a wave. He also gave an expression for the wavelength and that wavelength is known as the De Bruyne wave. So the expression for the wavelength given by De Bruyne was very simple. He said that any particle having mass m and velocity v has a wavelength given by the relation h by p where p is the momentum and the momentum of the particle is equals to mv. Thus, the de Broglie wavelength of any particle is equal to the Planck's constant divided by the momentum where momentum is equals to mass times the velocity. Do de Broglie gave this equation but the validity of this equation was given after many years. So when particles actually shows the characteristics that were shown by the waves experimentally. So electrons which were considered as in particles also showed phenomena like diffraction and interference which are shown by waves. Thus, this proves that electron shows both particle as well as wave property. As we have already seen that electromagnetic radiation shows both wave as well as particle characteristics but after it was found that electron which was initially considered as a particle shows phenomena such as diffraction and interference which are actually exhibited by waves proves that particles can also behave like waves. So let us now see what are the consequences of the de Broglie concept. So here we have taken an electron that is a microparticle and a tennis ball which is a macroparticle. So we have here the mass of an electron is 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg and the velocity is 10 to the power 6 meter per second. And in case of tennis ball we have considered the mass as 0 0.1 kg and the velocity as 20 meter per second. We have also given the Planck's constant as 6.6 .6 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. So using this formula lambda equals to h by mv we will try to find out the wavelength of the electron as well as the tennis ball. So you can pause the video and find out if you want. So after calculating we found that the wavelength associated with the electron was 725 nanometer whereas the wavelength associated with the tennis ball was 3.3 into 10 to the power minus 25 nanometer. It is due to this small value of wavelength in case of tennis ball that we cannot observe the wave character in tennis ball whereas we can absorb whereas we can observe the wave character in electron. So if we compare the wavelength value for the electron and the tennis ball, we will find that the wavelength value 
for the electron is quite higher than that of the tennis ball. Thus, we can say that we can observe the wave nature of electron whereas we cannot observe the wave nature of a tennis ball or any other macroscopic objects. So it is due to this reason that we cannot see wave nature in our surroundings in day to day life. So in the previous videos we have discussed about the postulates of the Bohr's theory. So when further experiments were carried out on the Bohr's model, it was found that the Bohr's model was valid only for single electron species, that, that is, species with more than one electron could not be explained by the Bohr's theory. The second failure was that, that it did not explain the splitting of lines. So when a spectral line was placed in the magnetic field, each spectral line gets splitted into a number of closely spaced lines. This is known as the G-man effect. So the next comes the Stark effect, which is similar to the G-man effect, and it is produced in the presence of an electric field. So these two are some of the fa failures of the Bohr's theory. Apart from this, we are going to see one more shortcomings of the Bohr's theory, which has led to the quantum theory. So this principle, named as the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, was the greatest, one of the greatest shortcomings of the Bohr's theory. So this principle was given by a scientist named Heisenberg. This principle states that the position and the momentum of an electron cannot be exactly determined simultaneously. That is, we cannot determine the exact position and the momentum of an electron simultaneously. So here, x is the position and px is the momentum. So the uncertainty in position multiplied by the uncertainty in momentum is greater than or equal to h by 4 pi. So we can write px that is the momentum equals to m into vx so putting this value in this equation we will get that the del x into m del vx is greater than equal to h by 4 pi since the uncertainty in mass is always very small so we write it as a constant factor so if we transfer the mass m to the right hand side we get as del x into del vx is greater than equal to h by 4 pi m. So the uncertainty is minimum here. Suppose the uncertainty in position is 0 then the uncertainty in the velocity will be very high or if the uncertainty velocity is zero then the uncertainty in position will be very high that is these two are inversely proportional to each other if one is greater then the other will be smaller or if other is greater then the former one will be smaller so from this it can be stated that the position and the momentum of an electron cannot be exactly determined simultaneously. So if we can determine the position, we cannot determine the velocity. Or if we can determine the velocity, we cannot determine the position. 